Okay, there we go, huh? Yeah, yeah that, was, that, was, that was very entertaining. Of course, it's not the first time I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think one of the remarkable things about this film is it, it really introduces us as Bram Stoker, an Irish author. And I don't think that's often understood by people. Um, so let's, let's think about a couple of different things. I, I first want to get your gut reaction to the film. You are really, um, in my mind, sort of one of the preeminent scholars of the Dracula story. You've, you've written several novels with other authors around the Dracula story. Um, you're spending a lot of time researching. One of the questions that we'll get to is actually a question about, is there an annotated um, edition of Bram Stoker with all the different influences, et cetera? I know that as one of your future projects and the things that you're working on, this is something that interests you. But what is your, your first gut reaction to the film? Well, I mean, the, the gut tells me, obviously, we've got a heavy slant towards the Irishness of Dracula. And the thing you have to remember is, for better or worse, Bram Stoker didn't leave us many clues about his inspiration, his motivation, and his writing of Dracula. So we have to speculate. And when we speculate, you run the risk of taking big leaps of faith or putting lots of little pieces of information together. And the, and, and the gentleman and the lady that spoke on this film are certainly educated people. They know their Irish Gothic literature. They put a lot of these clues together to come up with these speculations. Mm -hmm. And I guess the most important thing is, you know, if you really want the answers about Bram writing this, you do have to look beyond his life. What was, what was the situation like in Ireland when he grew up there? What were the influences from, first of all, the family itself? You know, who influenced him? When he moved off to Trinity, what was his mindset like? What was it like coming out of this childhood illness? Mm -hmm. And having been a teacher and a coach myself, I, I sort of bring that to the project. Whereas the folks who put on this movie and were, were featured in this movie are some of the, the best scholarly uh, authors around. I mean, I have the greatest respect for Paul Murray, who has done a fantastic job writing, I think, the best biography of him. So it's, it's a complex puzzle, Kate, and there's not one easy answer because we could just go to the source and say, well, let's pick up the autobiography of Bram Stoker. There isn't one. You've got to look at his Dracula notes. You've got to look what other people have said about him, his typescript. It's, it's a puzzle. And this mm -hmm. film helped put that puzzle together in a nice way. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the, the references to some of the Irish folklore, um, certainly we think about a young child confined to his bed for four or five years, battling an illness, the child's imagination, the mother's stories about the cholera epidemic, all these things sort of create this groundwork for something that eventually will become this, this book about this undead, this undead um, evil person, this devil. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, with this, even one piece, I mean, there are a couple little nuggets that he left, and it was mentioned in the film here that he says, in my childhood, I never knew it was like to stand upright for the first seven years of my life. I was near death. Well, he actually wrote that in the, in the book, Personal Reminiscence of Henry Irving. So that's one of the golden little nuggets that we have that says, okay, let's now combine that with exactly as you said, what's it like for a child to be an invalid for seven years in a busy household of six other kids? And he's being told stories that we actually have records of, the stories that his mom told him of premature burial, misdiagnosis. And so you put, you have to sort of put, speculate, put two and two together. Maybe, just maybe, Bram would think from time to time that he would be buried prematurely, misdiagnosed with his, his disease. Maybe he was bloodlet because he had some, some doctors in the family, uh, uncles that we're famous for bloodletting. One wrote a treatise. So again, I put that together and say, ah, that could have influenced the young child in the back of his head, you know, just create that somewhat trauma. And then years later, when he does go to the London Library and do some serious research, it, it all comes together. Right. And then he also is in that creative milieu with the, the wilds and, you know, other people that were part of that creative set in London. Um, at the time. So he has all these different things that are sort of juicing him up for the big, for the big reveal, the novel itself. Well, yeah, I've got, to, I've got to say this. There was a period, too, that he was coming out of his shell a, a, of, of the ill child, big growth spurt, grew to six foot two, goes to Trinity, 
becomes a champion athlete. This confidence moves him high up in the sort of big man on campus at Trinity, becomes the head of the fill, head of the hiss. And that's when he starts getting into Walt Whitman. And he shares these ideas with this professor. He has a great relationship with Edward Dowden, who's also a big uh, uh, expert on the occult, spiritualism. Dowden's daughter, Hester, was a, a noted medium. So you're right. He is entering into, you know, his, his interests bring him maybe away from the main line of his family. They were, who were doctors, three doctors, the daughters, the sisters were artists. And yet for, for Bram to flex his, you know, live out his dream, his vision quest to become a writer, he first moves to the theater and writes these theatric reviews and his father slaps him down and says, no, 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 the theater is not for you. Get, get back to work as a clerk in Petty Sessions. Mm -hmm. And yet he sneaks away to the wild household to these parties and gatherings where Speranza, just as this film pointed out, wrote these books. And I'm sure she encouraged him, you know, don't believe your dad, follow your dream and, and become this writer. Mm -hmm. So there are those undertones. He was a very complex guy. And I, I feel sad at, at certain points that, you know, he had to wait for his mother and father to move off to Europe before he could have the confidence to bust free of that influence and go with Irving to London to really live out his dream in a theater and writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions now that our audience are asking. And the, each one of them feeds into something I know that you and I talked about, we wanted to talk about. So let's look at a couple of them. Um, the first being, could you um, tell us a little bit more about how you were actually related to Bram Stoker? Because one of our questions is, Bram and Stoker are not common Irish names. I do believe Bram is a, a, a shortening of Abraham. Is that correct? It, that was okay. his father's name and he was his named after his name. father. Yeah, but okay, he, so. Bram was too, um, he didn't shorten the name and sort of, again, break three of his father's bonds until the father went off to Europe with okay. the girls to, for they could be trained in, in um, the, the arts. Mm -hmm. So how are, you, how are you related to Bram Stoker? Give us the, right. a, like a shortening of the tree there. The shortening of the tree is there were seven children in the, in, the, in the Stoker household and his youngest brother, George, was my great grandfather. And so mm -hmm. George had a son, Tom, and he came to Canada in around 1912. And he, he started working for the Canadian Pacific Railroad. And then he started as a stockbroker after that in Dominion Securities. And he went back and fought in World War I and then came back to Canada and married the lady who became my grandmother. So in Montreal, Canada, they had three sons. And that, that's how the, the Eastern branch of the Canadian <laughs> family joker started. <laughs> And so how has it fallen on your shoulders? Obviously it's a passion, but why are you the, the Stoker who has sort of taken up this mantle of uh, preserving the legacy of, of Bram Stoker and pushing it out and continuing to work on creative pieces that um, elucidate Stoker for everybody? Well, he, he, does, have, yeah, he does have two great grandsons um, mm -hmm. and, and they're all, they're, they're retired charter accountants. So they're not all that interested in writing and so on. But I did have an Uncle Patrick Stoker, Uncle Patty, who really did carry the banner. He was a proud Irishman till the day he died. He's actually, his, his ashes are scattered on Karen Tool because the Stoker family uh, married into the McLeacuddies of the Reeks. And it was Uncle Patty near the end of his life, while he was going through heart failure, asked my wife and I to come up from South Carolina and open up all these boxes and, and basically give us access to the family papers and said, Dacre, I know you're interested in this and your wife is interested in ancestry. Would you please carry this on? Now, I already had an interest um, in, in, in you know, digging up Bram, but it was the rest of the papers that really opened up the window. And so I've now taken on the responsibility, as my wife says, Dacre, if, if you don't do it, there will be a generation lost between Uncle Patty and then whom else? So yeah. we got to do it. And it's kind of nice because we do pass on his research, do some of our own, and pass it on to people like Paul Murray and others who do the, the, do the research mm -hmm. and, and write the books. And could you speak a little bit about where this, this discovery in 1970s, uh, the 1970s of the typescript, where we actually get a lot of information about um, 
Bram Stoker's thought processes and, and creative sort of mapping as he was thinking about the character of Dracula. Um, where are those papers now? And um, do you continue to use them? Is there, is there an annotation in the works of you know, relating those papers directly to the novel, et cetera? Yes, 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 and yes. First of all, there's the Dracula notes in the Rosenbach Museum, and they have been published uh, by Elizabeth Miller and Robert 18 Bassang, published by, I think, Macmillan. So those can be purchased um, what, in a wonderful way. You've got the facsimile on one side and, and then typed up so you can read the handwriting and how it relates to the story. And, and tell us again where that museum is. It's the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, it's a wonderful right. literary museum. But there's also the Dracula typescript, which is the, the last piece of writing that Bram Stoker had in his hands and his brother, who did all kinds of notes on it, that Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, who passed away a year or so ago, out in Seattle, he, he has that. And occasionally pages go on display at the Museum of Popular Culture. But if you, if you apply and you have good reason, they will allow you to look at it. And that's where I went out and found there was an alternate ending to Dracula that got edited out. And also there was another 101 pages that are missing somewhere, but I know where they are. <laughs> so there's, a, there's kind of a number of you know, pieces of this big puzzle. And, and yes, I, I have been working on an annotated Dracula myself. Uh, there have been numbers of others. Les Klinger has done a wonderful annotation as well. My annotation was with Robert 18 Bassang, who sadly died two weeks after we finished. And oh. he was one of the guys that, that did the Dracula notes. Mm -hmm. we will, I will get this published because I have vowed to his widow that his last work will go published at some time. And so what, what we do is we have insight from not only the Stoker family, but the notes and the typescript and all these other things that we've worked on over the years. It'll probably be another year, Kate, before that comes out. Okay. So let's dive a little deeper into the actual novel. Um, it's, it's an unusual form. It's an epistolary novel. It's basically a series of um, diary entries of the main characters. Um, I know that, that you and I have talked about some of the influences for these characters. Um, I actually think one of the heroes of the novel is um, Minnie or Minna, Minna yeah. Harker. Um, she's the one that kind of whips this team of Dracula hunters together and keeps them organized. and um, so and we see in the film that Bram Stoker's mother was, was quite a force. So what connections yeah. can you make between Mina Harker in the novel and Bram Stoker's mother? Well, first of all, let's, let's start with Mina because there, there's always plenty of focus on Dracula around this time of the year. One of them is this Rosenbach group that meets every Sunday online and goes through a chapter. And one of the things that everybody agreed upon, well, maybe almost everyone, is that when you look at it, it is Mina's story. She is the glue. And she does personify what Bram was trying to tell us is we need to recognize the strengths of the modern woman. She, she not only has the respect of everybody else in, of the band of heroes, she knows how to use a typewriter. She knows how to use a recording phonograph. And also she has great mercy. And which is re really incredible when you, when you read the last quarter of Dracula, when she has been vampirized herself and just seen her friend Lucy convert and then have to get staked and killed and head cut off and all that good stuff. Mm. And she, she lectures, at, even as she is going through the conversion before she is saved, she lectures the band of heroes saying, I know you have to go off and kill this, this creature, but please show God's mercy in doing so. And, and that's, a big, that's a big statement from Bram Stoker. And I really believe his mother is the influence. You know, she was a social activist who got up in the Society of Statistical Inquiry in Dublin and gave these talks on the education of the deaf and the dumb, on the plight of women in workhouses, on how to actually figure out if somebody who was insane could stand trial. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a lady well beyond her time and a real force. And I think she had a, a really big influence on Bram. Obviously, you know, it might have helped a little bit that he had to take, she had to take care of him for seven years along with the nanny. But nonetheless, I think Bram was very sensitive to, to the women's side of things. Um, and and this, this shows through 
you know, really bright, pit, bright, bright lights in Dracula. Mm -hmm. And one of our questions um, from our viewers is, do we know anything more about where she was from in Sligo? Well, I'll tell you this, I don't know exactly. I've been there because there is a Stoker Sligo Society and they have done a fantastic job in identifying a general block in Sligo where they think her house was. You know, mm -hmm. so, so much emphasis in Sligo is now because this cholera epidemic story, the cholera horror, incidentally, it's one of those projects that I'm working on to turn into a graphic novel because I think it's super powerful and it did have an influence on Bram. So you can go online and check out the Stoker Sl Sligo Society. You go to Sligo, they've got nice banners showing you where the houses are, where the grave sites are. And they tell the story really through her eyes because her, her account of the 1832 epidemic is one of the few accounts that they have that the scholars really believe is the truth. Wow, that's amazing, amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that, and again, I'm just gonna keep letting people know more about what you do uh, in the context of looking at some of the questions and some of the issues. Um, one of the things you do is you take people on tours to places that were important in the Bram Stoker and Dracula story. Um, uh, you've take them, you take them to Whitby, you take them to Dublin. Um, help me out, where else? Uh, Cruden Bay, Scotland, and of Cruden, course, yeah, Transylvania. Right. And Transylvania. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Transylvania a bit. So Stoker <laughs> never went to Transylvania, no, but he did a lot of research. And yeah. in the course of his research, obviously he, he begins to see these stories and, and he's verifying that these stories exist. Um, why do you think he picked Eastern Europe? Why Eastern Europe to, to place this story? Well, it, it was mentioned in the film and I agree, there's an interesting similarity between the rural towns and superstitions in Ireland, which Bram traveled to when he was promoted to become the inspector of petty sessions all over Ireland. So imagine him getting on long train rides, carriage rides, and going to locales that he was not necessarily, you know, really uh, welcomed because he's the inspector coming in to make sure everybody's doing all the right stuff. Mm -hmm. So. I think he had a little bit of the Harker vibe. I think he experienced that going out of his comfort zone like Harker did. Mm -hmm. But when he went into the London Library, it was a, a well-known fact at the time that the sort of the civilized world, as far as Britain was concerned, sort of ended at Budapest. And luckily there were a number of adventurers like Charles Bonner, Andrew Cross, Elizabeth Macciarelli, um, Major Johnson, and all four of those people wrote books that were in the London Library that a year and a half ago were discovered that they were there and Bram had access to them, but he also wrote notes in them. So even though he didn't go to Transylvania, he benefited from like Kate, yours and I going on Google to see what do the mountain range look like? What the Carpathians look like? What does Bistritza look like? Yeah. He had those books that described in great detail, the people, the culture, the history, the mountainside, and being a founding member of the Dublin Painting and Sketching Club, Bram took that into his mind's eye and it would help him do his writing and describe the countryside. And I think there really was this parallel between another world, you know, off in the middle of nowhere, known as the land beyond the forest, which is the name of the Emily Gerard book. That was something he got keyed into by Speranza Wilde. And there was a copy of that in the London Library. So all these little things like a piece of the puzzle come together and help give Bram this incredible vivid picture with the experiences he had in Ireland to what he would imagine those adventurers had similar experiences. So it was natural for him then to put that story there. Mm -hmm. And then of course he found the mountain range that he was looking for. And right. we'll get to that later. <laughs> and there's certainly some of the theatrics and that we would have to guess they came from his time with um, with Irving as sort of Irving's right hand man or bag man, as we might say today. Um, you know, he, he's working in a very theatrical, dramatic world. So he's able to flesh out those details of the novel in that way. Um, let's talk a little bit about the transformation of Dracula. And I mean, in the sense that for folks who haven't actually read the novel, I, I do recommend it. It's a pretty quick read. 
Um, Dracula, as Bram Stoker depicted him, was a decrepit, old creature, ugly. Um, you get some of that in some of that silent movie clip uh, within the film that we saw. But certainly by the early part of the 20th century, the notion of Dracula has transformed to something a little more suave, a Bela Lugosi with a big cape, and he's handsome, and he drinks good wine, and, you know, sucks good blood, etc. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how, why was it important that that transformation was made? Because the transformation actually helps to make Bram Stoker famous for Dracula, because what we think of Dracula is Bela Lugosi, or I think we laughed about this, um, when I was a kid, I used to run home from school to watch this gothic soap opera series called Dark Shadows. And it was about, you know, this very suave uh, family up in Maine and the, the, the patriarch was a, was a vampire. I mean, you know, so we just don't, our, our sort of popular notion of, of Dracula is not the way he was originally written. So how did that transformation happen? Yeah. How and why? Well, uh, I mean, the, fir the first thing is, and before I forget this, I've got to say, Bram was smart enough to realize he had to protect the dramatic rights. So he actually didn't intend, the, that's the one flaw I have in the movie, that his play was, was an error, was, was a, a failure. It wasn't. He didn't intend to make this a play. It was simply a, a staged reading to protect the dramatic copyright. I've seen the script. He just simply cut pages out of a early edition Dracula and, and, and quick little notes, one, only one script. And these 12 actors sat on the stage and read it, two people in the audience, and then Irving walked by and said, dreadful. So anyway, Bram knew at some day, being a theatrical manager and watching Henry Irving and Faust, that this devil was, was going to be a big hit someday. So as, the, as he dies in 1912, and before even it gets on stage, Nosferatu is a movie made with a copyright infringement by the German company Prana Films and Bram's wife, actually uh, with the help of the British Writers Society, they sued Prana who didn't have any money, they claimed bankruptcy. And so apparently all copies of the film were gone, but of course one survived. And that's why we get to see Count Orlock and some of the clips in this movie. But what, what you know, sort of to get to your question, Theatrical plays at the time in the in the early 20s, you couldn't have had Bram Stoker's gnarly, ugly, bad breath Dracula on stage with hairy palms and looking like Count or you know Orlock. That would have scared people off from even showing up. The reviews would have been terrible. You know, how how dare you do that sort of thing? People would have run for cover. So instead they had to have this attractive, as you say, suave Devonair Eastern European uh, be the leading man. And at first it was um, uh, Ed Edwin Blake. And then later on, we, we end up when it comes to America, Bela Lugosi. And mm -hmm. that personifies the Dracula, the high cape actually was a stage prop. So the Dracula could turn around, the, the, the uh, collar was attached by wires and then the Dracula could disappear on a, in a mm -hmm. trap door. Mm -hmm. But that was the beginning of the transformation that totally changed the look. And to a certain extent, the movies had to merge different sets and, and characters. Because again, as you pointed out, Kate, the epistolary style with constantly different points of view change, no play or no, any movie could keep up with those set changes. So they did change. They were not all that faithful. They were inspired by the story. But there was one later on that, that was in 77, fairly faithful. But that started the transformation as we now know it today. Okay, because one of our first questions um, from um, Beryl, one of our audience members, uh, what film version of Dracula do you think is the best? Um, I'm an aspiring screenwriter who loves vampire stories. I wish to write my own vampire stories. So I think the answer to that is, is there really a film version that is true to the novel? Probably not. <laughs> But certainly to the transformed character that Dracula becomes, what, what, is, what is your favorite Dracula film? Well, I, I, again, the favorite is, is simply, I like a lot of them, but I really like the 1977 Louis Jordan version. It was a miniseries the BBC put on. Louis Jordan does look nothing like Bram's Dracula, but the story itself 
the film adaptation is close to the book. Mm -hmm. But for entertainment, I like the 1992 Francis Ford Coppola version, which also is nothing like the book, but there was good special effects, amazing mm -hmm. costumes, you know, some good drama. So I think, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> And it's a question of what do, what do you like? Do you like the more sexy ones? Do you like the more violent ones with the heads coming off? Do you like all the special effects of Dracula untold? Or do you like something that's more true and faithful to the novel? Mm -hmm. I, I like the BBC Netflix one that just came out a year ago. Mm -hmm. Again, Mar Moffat and Gaddis reimagined the story, very different than what Bram wrote, but still an entertaining inspiration of Bram's original right. novel. And, you know, so much fun um, in popular culture, the whole idea of undead and horror, and so much of that has roots into this transformed creature. Uh, one of my favorite movies is What We Do in the Shadows, which has turned yeah. into a TV series um, yes. about this crazy group of vampires that show up in Staten Island and start doing crazy things. So, you know, the influences just keep coming on and on and on. Um, let me look at a couple of the other questions here and make sure that we... Um, Let's see here. So one of the questions is, what can Stoker's writing tell us about Irish culture and history during his lifetime? Well, we do know he's, he's born in, in 1847. So it is the black, black 1847, probably the, one of the worst winters of the Great Famine, the Great Hunger. Um, we also know that um, you know, he has some involvement in, um, you know, some of the cultural scene. He also is, um, I, I love this notion that's brought up of his, of, of being liminal, you know, not quite all Irish, not quite all English. So he's, he's sort of looking for ways to combine these two aspects of who he is into something that is creative. Um, and there's what religious you, conflict, you know. Yeah, the religious you, conflict. You and I yeah. chatted about. Yeah. And here, and, and it's a topic we could go on forever with this. But here, yeah. here's what I believe: he was Church of England, um, in in a you know Catholic country, but he also drank the Kool Aid, so to speak, of Walt Whitman, who sort of pledged this whole concept of pantheism, this idea that all religions are okay, mm -hmm. and sort of this uni universalist idea of Mother Earth, and. I think Bram, being as sensitive as he was to his surroundings, was sort of sick and tired of religious conflict. And, and one day, this is the cool thing about Marsh's Library in Dublin, that Jason McGilley got has put an exhibition on because in 1866, Bram walked in there to study religious conflict. And the books that he took out, some of them were religious conflict, some were other things. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Murray and I have had discussions about what else was he looking for. And if we think only, you know, one element was religious conflict, but he did stumble upon a book that had the name Dracula in it. And he was discussing sort of the conflict between the Ottomans and the Austrian Hungarians. But in, in general, when I look at Dracula this way, as I'm doing this um, annotated edition with Robert, we talked about faith. And it's a big part of this story, good and evil, mm -hmm. where you've got to have faith in, in something. It doesn't really matter what religion it is, mm -hmm. even though obviously in the novel, they'll be you know, the cross and the wafer and everything else um, besides the Catholicism is what repels the count. But the point is, you've got to be bound together. The, those people of hope need to be bound together of faith. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's Bram's message, regardless of the religion. And I think that's, that's a point that he was reacting to what he saw around him. Right. And also, I mean, in, in his travels as a civil servant um, throughout many different parts of Ireland, he would have been in areas where superstition ran high, oh, yeah. um, you know, fairy trees, fairy rocks. So the superstition um, is, is part of what builds that built that idea that he's um, creating. Um, the crucifix, I mean, all, even the even the use of you know strong um, botanicals to ward off disease and things like that. These are all things that he probably could have seen in various, um, um, particularly more rural areas in Ireland that he went into. Well, I, I'm sure that's, that, that's what one of the gentlemen in, in the film said. And when he picked up the book by Emily Gerard, the Scottish lady living in Transylvania, who had exactly the same outlook on Transylvania. And mm -hmm. she picked up all these superstitions and traits. 
So I think Brand may have had this sort of aha moment when he was doing the studying of, ah, oh, this is so much like comb, this makes sense. And so he probably felt natural to sort of do this, but obviously he set the story over there. And, and I'm not sure what our time is like, but I do want to tell about the volcano for a moment, because I, I think that was one of the final little pieces of what he found in the London Library, was that as he had his devil-like character, and he was looking in these books, which I have actually read through most of them, the common thought of them at the time was volcanoes were portals to hell and where subterranean evil gods would live. And as he is looking for a place for his devil, and he finds this in the Eastern European range of the Carpathians, and his, in his notes, Kate, he actually wrote lines of longitude and latitude and rivers and such that all pinpointed a certain place in the Eastern Transylvanian mountains mm -hmm. on Mount Israel, which was, as you could tell from my, my buildup, a Eight. old volcano. <laughs> and the original ending of Dracula that I saw in Seattle mm -hmm. before it was edited out, mm -hmm. as soon as the Count was stabbed by Quincy Morris and his throat was slit, the Count crumbled into dust and a volcano erupted. Mm. And it's detail oriented, as we know, our writer of Dracula, our inspector of clerks of petty sessions, our man with the masters in mathematics, he made darn sure that all the details were right, that he would have had that final scene on an actual volcano. Wow. So we have another question about influence. Do we know if he ever visited um, the crypt at St. Michael's in Dublin? We, you know, as a student at Trinity, what do you think? It's quite possible, you know, who knows? There, there's no record of it, but people love to say, I'm sure he must have gone down there and seen these, these mummified bodies. Who knows? Mm -hmm. it, it, it could easily be, don't right. know. And um, did he ever visit America? A eight times. <laughs> oh, sure okay. Did. Oh, sure did. He, he, yep. came, he, came, he came with the Lyceum Theater eight times, traveled from Montreal all the way through the US. I've actually seen the letterheads of all the different tours. I've seen one map that he drew. He wrote on a map all the train routes and the exact distances because he was in charge of the whole squad. Mm -hmm. I mean, they brought all their set designers and everybody else over all the way over to, to Seattle, Portland, San Francisco. So he was well versed with America. He actually wrote a paper called A Glimpse of America. Mm -hmm. And of course he discovered and made good friends with Buffalo Bill Cody who then he modeled Quincy Morris after. So mm -hmm. he, he loved America, felt very strong. He was a big fan of Lincoln. Um, and of course, Walt Whitman and him were good friends. Whitman actually left, in, uh, left for him in his will, all of his notes on Abraham Lincoln, wow. which Bram then took and, and used to give lectures on Lincoln. And in return, Bram gave his typescript of Dracula to Thomas Donaldson, who was the, who was the friend of Whitman and the lawyer who made mm -hmm. the exchange of these two papers after Whitman had died. Mm -hmm. And he was also a fan of Mark Twain, right? They were actually good friends good and friends. neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. And he actually was a, uh, Bram was an agent for him uh, and one of the books that he had published uh, for, for um, Mark Twain. And I believe Mark Twain's spiritualism, uh, these ideas sort of uh, had a, you know, both of them found kindred, kinship in that concept of spiritualism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think, let's see, um, have you thought of looking into the traditions and practices of ancient Egypt for a context to these ideas about burials and agriculture? So these are all foundational things that have been passed from culture to culture, but uh, it, it goes back pretty far. No, it does. I know Bram was very aware that Oscar Wilde's father Dr. William Wilde was an Egyptologist who actually went there and wrote a, a massive long treatise on Egypt and actually brought back a mummified child. And Bram used some of that information in his story, Jewel of Seven Stars. So uh -huh. even though I have not done the work, uh, it's something I got to play catch up on with, with Uncle Bram. Uh -huh. Oh, that's great. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about where you are right now with some of your projects. Um, I, I, I know you're working on a graphic novel. There's a film script. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on. 
Um, what do you, what do you want to tell us about? Well, I, I think probably the most exciting thing is, is I, I found a team of people, Jessica Martin in, in England and an Irish guy living in Edmonton, Canada. We've decided that some of Bram's short stories, as well as this color story that I was telling you about, need a wider audience. So we've actually got a, a contract with a, a British publisher and we're working towards six of them over the next year and a half. So that, that's going to be cool. I've never gotten into graphic novels, but I'm learning how to adapt stories to that. Um, the, the film that I've just started working on, I've done episode one of my search for Bram Stoker's fictional castle, Dracula. And that's why I got so excited when, we, when I started talking about you know, Mount Israel. And, and the whole idea, Kate, is to go back to these places that you and I have been chatting about, Whitby, Cruden Bay, Scotland, Dublin, mm -hmm. London, where his research took place, where the places in the novel happened, why did they happen the way they did, what did Bram know about them, and sort of connecting the dots and turn that into sort of a, a six episode uh, sort, sort of series on the mysteries behind the research and the writing of Dracula. And we've done episode one so far. Oh, that'll be very cool. Now, so when the book was published, what do we know what his family felt about it? So I, his parents, his wife, his, his child, what was their reaction to the publication of the book? Well, we, we don't know that much. What we do know is his mother actually wrote him two letters over the course of the three months after it came out. Um, he sent his mom a book with the inscription to my dearest mother. Mm -hmm. And it was the day before it came out. That's the book that somehow my father has and passed on to me. So I know his mom read it and the two letters that she wrote were glowing. I mean, not just, oh son, good job. It, it was, you know, nothing since Mary Shelley's Frankenstein has come close to this in its horror and its suspense. Uh, another one, you know, Poe po is nothing compared to this. So, <laughs> you, you know, she, again, she was not a person who, um, you know, would just give a, gl a glowing response for the sake of it. But there's nothing that from any of the other brothers, you know, I don't know if they were proud of him, but I will say this, when it first came out, not many, um, nobody found many reviews while the biographies were written over the next 50 years. And it wasn't until recently that the party line has changed from, oh, it was met with mixed reviews. And I've read the reviews because a good friend of mine at, who's now at the uh, Savannah College of Art and Design as a, as, a, as a professor teaching English literature, he's done this incredible work for his doctoral thesis and he's found the digitization of over a hundred reviews. Wow. Not just, not just the six mm -hmm. that that statement was based on. And he mm -hmm. found that of the hundred, there was still only one or two that were somewhat negative, Kate. Okay? And the negative was, oh my gosh, this, this is too horrifying. I don't think we're ready for this. This is too sensational. This is too realistic. So the, the, generally the professional reviews are, oh my God, Stoker has done this. I can't imagine the mild-mannered, stage manager of Henry Irving wrote this stuff. You know, what, where's, this, where's the cape behind Superman here? So yeah. he's really, he kind of shocked people with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, again, this is, this is a, a, a character and a story that has endured. Um, there have been, um, you know, theatrical productions. There have been dance interpretations. There have been movie, you know, ballet, all, all kinds of things. Um, what, artistic medium do you think is best suited to tell the Dracula story? You know, I've never been asked that question and I've been asked some doozies. <laughs> that's, that's tough because the visual nowadays, everybody wants something visual. Uh -huh. But as we said earlier, you know, now that we have the ability to do these streaming series where you have episodes, as opposed to try to squeeze everything in a two hour feature film. I'm biased towards the ability to properly film this, this, mo this book. And, and as Christopher, I actually have a poster up in my office right here. It says, nobody has ever filmed it as Bram Stoker wrote it by Christopher Lee. And that's, that's right, because it's, it's very difficult to squeeze into. And the best one was a three part series. 
I think if somebody was to approach it in probably a six part series, they could get it fairly realistic and with, of course, pretty cool graphics and so on. So I still am biased towards the visual, although I love stage productions and ballets and so on, because everyone's different. You know, they love the music associated. They love the vibe. They love the feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we got the bulk of the questions. Um, so the next bit, the, the very next thing we can expect from you is some, it's a short story that you've actually written, right? Well, I've got, I've got a short story, which is, 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 is one of these ones that makes me kind of get the warm fuzzies when I tell you this, because everything I've learned about my great grand uncle Bram, I had to do some speculation, but I've written a story called Last Days. And I imagine what his last week was like. You know, he didn't have an easy last few years. He had one stroke. He went partially blind. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a pension from the Bicene Theater. He didn't, wasn't in, in Irving's will. He was struggling, you know, and that's sad for a, a man that gave his all, a creative soul. And now he's winding down his life. His body is betraying him. He was a great athlete. And so I imagine what that was like. But then I know he was very close to his, his family. I, we have his brother Thornley there, his son Noel, and his wife. And during this story, he opens up this box or he gets his brother to bring out the box and he opens up these secrets that he doesn't want to take to the grave with him. And one of the secrets is what was left out of Dracula? Mm -hmm. you know, what was the beginning of Dracula? Here it is. And in real life, Kate, he actually left for his wife the manuscript for Dracula's guest, which is a 17 page short story that she published two years after he died as, an, as a, an original story. And in the preface for this, she said, this was excised from my husband's most famous work. Mm -hmm. And I have studied this and I have now proof, absolute proof that it was once part of the manuscript. Mm -hmm. So I urge the listeners, go take a look at Dracula's Guest. You can get it for free on, on Gutenberg. But what Bram does is tell his wife and therefore he tells his fans through my voice, some of these secrets that I have found that I think Bram would like his family to know. And then of course we go off a little bit on how did Renfield actually become the, you know, the mental patient, what happened to him? Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna tell you the answer to that, but that's a short story <laughs> coming out uh, in, the, in the magazine Weird Tales on November 11th, which is okay. cool because it's a magazine that Bram was published in back in the early 1900s and then in the 30s, it closed down and it's just come back again. So it's neat to have a Stoker story back in Weird Tales. Very cool. Well, I think we can safely say that most of what you're going to be reading over the next several years and, and to follow about Bram Stoker, about Dracula, about the, the academic and the research piece of uh, Bram Stoker is gonna come from um, our, our panelist here, um, Dager Stoker. So thank you so much. Um, before we sign off, I just want to um, make sure people understand that we do have another Irish popcorn series coming up in November. Um, we're going to push it to November 18th so that those of us celebrating um, American Thanksgiving um, will not have a conflict. Um, and the film is going to be Explore, Dream, Discover Together, Ireland and Japan. Very interesting look at how Japan and Ireland is, as islands how they're dealing with the pandemic, some really interesting stuff. Um, we're going to have some of the creators there. And then um, Paul Murray, well, I, um, former uh, Irish diplomat and who uh, Dacre also knows, will be the moderator for that event. So that's November 18th. Um, also check solusnua.org. Um, we have our book clubs um, coming up. Um, let's see, November 9th, we have our fiction club. November 16th, we have our poetry group and November 23rd on nonfiction group. And most exciting, this Saturday, Halloween, uh, we are co-sponsoring um, with uh, uh, Global Irish Studies Program and Politics and Prose, the Dublin Voices series, Joseph O'Connor, who has come out with a new fictionized novel, but the main character is Bram Stoker. So that's all I'm gonna tell you about that. It's called Shadow Play. Um, a wonderful novel. Um, so tune in to the Politics and Prose uh, Dublin Voices series 
um, October 31st. And for those of you uh, watching from Ireland and other parts of Europe, you'll be happy to know that is an afternoon Eastern Standard Time series, so you don't have to stay up so late to participate in it. I believe it starts at 3 o'clock on Saturday, but check, um, check our website as well as Politics and Crows. Um, as Dacre and I have gone back and forth to talk about this evening, um, just recently sent to me a most lovely quote from Dacre's obituary that appeared in the New York Times. And I've asked Dacre to close this um, with um, some quotes from that obituary because I think it's a nice frame to, to help us understand the Halloween week. Um, what the All Souls Day means in Irish culture and for, and for many of us, it's really a special remembrance of people who have um, left us but are still always with us. Um, I do want to thank you again very much, Dacre, for being part of this um, um, event tonight. I know that our audience has enjoyed it. Um, I know we didn't get to absolutely every question, but we tried to hit on most of the things that people brought up. And um, at any time, uh, please reach out to us at Solus Nua and we can um, look for more ways to uh, answer some of your questions, okay? So we're gonna close with this quote. Um, this quote and from, any... from Bram Stoker's obituary in the New York Times, 1912. Not the whole thing, but part of it. And I'll just say this before I do it. If you do want any more information about Bram Stoker or any of the members of the family, go check out uh, the website that my wife and I organize and, and run, www.bramstokerestate.com. And my books are there, but also lots of information about Bram and his family. So here we go. I'll try to keep it together as I read this, because I really think the, the person who wrote this hit the nail on the head with Uncle Bram. He was never tired and never depressed. He remembered the faces and the names of all he ever met, or if he did not, he had the skill to make others believe that he did. Undoubtedly, much of Sir Henry Irving's success was due to him. For the rest, he wrote fluently and was eagerly interested in all the affairs of the world. Deep down in his nature, there was a touch of Celtic mysticism. It sought its expression in literary form. He had plenty of friends and enough enemies to indicate that his friendship was worth having the embodiment of health and strength and geniality. It seems he died too young. He was only 64 years of age. Almost everyone who knew him will say that he should have lived to be 90 and kept a young heart in his old age. Here's to you, Bram, on Halloween. There we go. All right, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a safe and happy Halloween week, and we'll see you next month.